Welcome to the Beyond the Mat Podcast, an in-depth talk show discussing exclusively WWE topics. My name's Rick Boogs, and I came to rock with the Beyond the Mat Podcast that is beyond the M-A-T-T Podcast Podcast. Podcast! Welcome to Beyond the Mat Podcast. It is May 24th, 2022. We're here for the weekly fix. Kyle is absent tonight. I hope you're doing all right, Kyle. I have Brad with me tonight as my tag team partner. We're going to go over a couple of fan questions here in the beginning that we got that we think are a little bit pertinent right now. And we will also go over the happenings of smackdown and raw and whatever else has come out in the news over the weekend including roman reigns rumored three opponents for the summer and a couple other things that have come out how you doing brad doing good matt thanks for having me on this evening all right so in a nutshell what do you think about the last week in wwe we had the tag unification on friday and things like that what a crazy week. What a crazy week. I mean, you know, the idea that, you know, to me, it's a little sad, like thinking that, you know, we lost, you know, kind of our favorite women's tag team and in a certain way, our favorite men's tag team, at least for the time being in the same week. But this was also a really exciting week. You know, we saw some really crazy things, including like you just mentioned, that title change on SmackDown, which I think very few people expected. So it was great. Yeah. You know, the thing is about that is that up until midday friday they did not have a finish determined for that and they were not going to actually follow through with unifying those titles they were going to have it have a non-finish no contest something like that and push it to hell in the cell but they ended up having the finish on the pay-per-view what did you think about all the crowd shots and the post-match beatdown and that one of riddle and orton by the bloodline that's what makes, and, and there's many people that I know that mentioned this to me, and you, I think, had mentioned it on your podcast post-Smackdown uh, last week or on Friday, but it was amazing how those cameramen caught those things, and they were ready to catch those things. They, they caught them on the fly, impromptu. It just shows how incredible WWE's production value is. I mean, they do not miss a beat 99% of the time. The production is amazing. Yeah, I thought they did a really good job with that, finding the people. And, you know, you had kids in there that were in tears. You had grown men and women that were just totally, you know, for lack of a better term, baffled and you know, dismayed by everything that was going on. And honestly, at home, I was feeling the same way. And they, you know, for for what it's worth at the time, I was pissed off. I was mad at Roman Reigns. I, I was upset. And that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to make you feel something. And they really made me feel something with that. And I really think they just did a hell of a job doing that. And at the end of the day, whether I feel like I hate somebody or I feel like I love somebody. In this case, you know, the week prior I was at SmackDown and I had said I'd never felt, you know, a part of something, an act in WWE that was so over as I did when I was in there for RK Bro and everybody was going crazy. And then a week later we see them get totally dismantled. So, you know, that's just the range of emotions that you can go through in a week. And when they can target those emotions, that's the ultimate sort of goal or sort of thing that I think that they're trying to achieve or I'm trying to gain by watching it. So that was great. And then we, you know, get the riddle emotional promo on Monday for the opening of Monday Night Raw. I didn't know if this was the best position to put him in to start the show off, but what did you think of Riddle's promo? 
Look, I thought his promo itself was great. I completely thought the same thing as you. Um, it, 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 it didn't seem right at the beginning of the show, but it shows you that they're boosting Riddle into being an enormous, you know, player on the WWE map, uh, in the landscape. And, you know, to me, just getting back to, you know, the finish of, of the RK bro Usos match, if they're not going to advance something this Friday and move us towards a Hell in a Cell main event between RK and the Usos, which based on that promo, it seems like they're not going to do. It, just because of the Randy is hurt, Randy can barely move, his back, you know, I'm going at it alone type of thing from Riddle. It makes me think that, you know, it, it's not going to be the main event at Hell in a Cell as of right now today. And, 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 so, so what does that mean? What will be the main event for Hell in a Cell? Because this is coming up in, in, you know, nine days. I don't know. Hell in a Cell, main event. You know, we got the Raw Women's Championship match, Triple Threat, Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch, and Asuka, which we found out after the main event on Raw, which we'll get into in a minute. But we have that match. Um Thinking of other big matches, the Seth and Cody match, that's not a main event match. There's no title involved there. I, I, I always did think that regardless of what happened in the SmackDown match, whether the Usos won, whether RK-Bro won, that this match would end up in the Hell in the Cell and would end up, you know, with the Usos winning at Hell in the Cell with no interference because they won this with interference. I do see what you mean about Randy Orton and it, them teasing that he's going to be away for a while. Maybe he makes a triumphant return next week and we get a setup for a rematch at Hell in a Cell and the Usos go over and that basically cements them as the unified tag champs and then we move on with the Riddle and Roman Reigns things. Basically, maybe Riddle will say, you know what, we lost that match, but I don't care. The one I really want is Roman. But again, it seems like we're already moving towards the Riddle and Roman Reigns program because of the fact that we had Riddle run wild in that tag match to start Raw and the Usos back down from him, almost signaling that they don't want to deal with Riddle right now. And Riddle's elevated himself to another level to kind of challenge Roman Reigns now. And that's sort of maybe how they want us to see Riddle. Certainly, that's they wanted to see us have us see him in a different light because he was way more serious in this opening promo than he's ever been in any other promo for them. He's usually being a goofball and he was very serious in this one. So I don't know. I mean, that this because they're doing what they're doing, I don't know what match could main event that show other than the women's three-way championship match. Is, is there any other ones you're thinking of that we've seen? No, and, and you're right, but about the women's tag team or the women's three way, but that women's match doesn't feel like it's had enough build for people to really get invested in it. I mean, when's the last time that you can remember that we had a typical episode of SmackDown or Raw that didn't end or begin with either the Usos, Roman Reigns, or RK Bro? Because I cannot remember one. I really can't remember one over maybe the last six to nine months. Um, maybe I'm missing one, but the point is we're going to have a pay-per-view that doesn't include RK Bro and it doesn't include the Usos and it doesn't include Roman Reigns. It's, it's very strange. And I do not feel like Bianca has been positioned in a way that allows this to really feel like a main event that mad. Because Bianca hasn't been featured as prominently as, as you'd like to see her featured. Yeah, I mean, all we've seen is the Bloodline opening and closing shows or RK Bro opening and closing shows. I don't understand why Bianca Belair has won the Women's Raw Championship. She's, you know, not somebody who they hide from promos. You know, she's not a Ronda Rousey behind the mic. And as the homegrown talent who's now the champion who's been through all this stuff and went through the whole program with Becky Lynch and all that. She's a new big baby face champion, very young. You would think that they'd have her prominently featured to open Raw at least once or twice a month and also 
be in the main event. And just thinking of this last episode of Raw, why not have Bianca Belair open the show, welcome us to Raw, and then in the process of that, you have Becky Lynch interrupt that promo. Maybe the promo is all about how she's going to beat Asuka at Hell in a Cell. Becky Lynch comes out, says, hey, wait a minute. I deserve to be a part of that match. I never got my rematch against you. Asuka comes out and says, you didn't get through me. Whatever else Asuka says, you know, I'm not going to get into her character flaws, in my opinion. And then Pierce comes out and says, you know what? We'll have that match tonight between Becky and Asuka. And if Becky wins, it becomes a triple threat. Boom. You get your main event set up and you get your face of the company, Bianca Belair, featured on the opening of Raw. I understand the importance of Roman Reigns and Riddle and why they needed to have Riddle come out here, especially after that big match on SmackDown. But to me, they could have gotten that accomplished in the second hour or something like that. They didn't need to lead the show with it. What do you think about the positioning and the pacing of Raw, you know, with those two things in particular and just with the show in general? Well, that this Raw, and, and I'm I'm not a WWE basher by any means. I love a lot of the stuff that they do. I love almost everything they do. But this, to me, felt wrong, not leading with a Bianca. And it, the show seemed to take a different pace because you started with the Riddle promo. So if you started, again, bringing out Bianca, the crowd goes nuts because it's the first thing they're seeing. They're live on television. They know it. They're excited. No matter who they brought out there, they would have gone nuts. But especially your champion, who happens to be, other than Austin Theory, your only champion on this brand now, right? You don't have a tag team champion. You don't have a WWE champion. So all you have is Bianca and Theory. Yeah, and, and Theory was supposed to be in a program against Mustafa Ali on Monday, but for some reason that got nixed, and I'm not sure why. But then, yeah, the only real exclusive Raw Champions you have is, I guess, the 24-7, if you want to call it that. And you have the U.S. title, and then you have Bianca Belair, and she's supposed to be, you know, maybe part of it's they want to protect her because she was pushed so strongly leading into WrestleMania and had so many promos with Becky that they just don't want people to get sick of her like people tend to do to baby faces that get pushed hard. But I don't know, back to what you were saying about the pacing of Raw. No, and I, and I get it. And the weird thing about the Bianca championship thing since she's won it has been the last few weeks, especially, she comes out, she does her little dance, she comes out into the ring, all cool, all great. And then she comes to commentary. They go, Bianca is going to be on commentary with us and does not say a word. I mean, maybe she said two words last time. And this week, I don't think she said one word. So, which is weird. Like, you think they would at least want to feature her voice. It's almost like she's like a mute now and doesn't get to say anything. So, so to me, you're having a championless show, basically. And you're with your only champion, um, not talking or doing anything, um, which is weird. And that's why I don't think, getting back to my point, that Bianca, Asa, and Becky can be the main event of Hell in a Cell. If I'm a fan and I go to that and I buy, I pay seven hundred dollars for tickets, I'm disappointed that that's the main event. So, do you think? I mean, so what alternative matches do you think would be good for the main event of that show? And do you think that something's going to happen with RK Bro and the Usos in a rematch, or do you think that that's definitely done? Well, after Friday, I thought one hundred percent you were going to see. That's bullshit. Roman cheated. He interfered. We lost our belts. We demand a rematch with no interference possible because it's in a cell. And that's immediately, boom, your main event for the pay-per-view. I, you know, and also a good stipulation to utilize from a television perspective, why Roman's not there. Oh, he's barred. He's banned. He interfered in the championship match, you know, whatever. So, you know, to me, without having, but now after that promo that we saw on Monday, you're not going to have it. I don't think you're going to have it. And I don't understand where they're going. I'm, I'm not bashing Becky. I'm not bashing Bianca. I'm not saying they're not exciting. I'm not saying I'm not going to love it. But what I'm saying is it doesn't feel like a program that's, wow, this is the main event of a pay-per-view right now. 
Yeah, I agree, man. I think that, you know, I, I'm excited to see the match and I'm excited for Bianca because I know she's going to win and it's going to end up, you know, making her a little bit bigger because she's going to be defeating Becky and Asuka in the same match. But I have a feeling that Asuka is going to take the pin. Becky's not going to. So it's going to sort of push down Asuka a little bit in the pecking order. But at the end of the day, Becky needs to supplant. I'm sorry. Bianca needs to supplant herself as the champion, defeat Becky for a second time, having Asuka in there. She's seen as somebody who's a strong character. So, you know, having this match, I, I like the match and I like the story behind it. I don't think that there's been any bill because we haven't heard a peep from Bianca. But, you know, I think that's the only thing they can really put in the main event. And, you know, do I like the build? Not really. But I don't know what other matches are worthy of that main event other than the tag match rematch if it happens. But we're not getting anything about that. And I agree that it would be the perfect thing to have in the cell because it ended with an interference. I'm not sure what the story is with that. And, of course, the piece that you said about how we know Roman's not going to be there. So he's not going to interfere anyway. So you might as well put him in the cell. But we already know there's going to be one men's hell in the cell match. That's Cody and Seth. I think that they're only going to do a men's and a women's Hell in a Cell match. So of all the women's Hell in a Cell matches, before we go to our first break, which are all the women's matches that could be at Hell in a Cell pay-per-view? I don't want to miss Hell in a Cell, the pay-per-view with Hell in a Cell, the actual match, because you know it's already confusing. But of all the women's matches we have possibly for Hell in a Cell, the pay-per-view, which do you think seeing do you see could be inside the cell? I'm so sorry, Matt. Am I missing something? What other women's matches are there? Because I was under the impression that there was supposed to be uh, Ronda versus Sasha Banks. Obviously, that's not happening. Happening. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what other women are even competing in this, <laughs> let alone worthy of being in a cell where the feud is that hot and that intense. I, I have no idea what Ronda's going to do. Well, I set you I up there. Been. I set you up there yeah. because th there hasn't been any other women's matches announced except for that one. And then Ronda's supposed to have a match, but we don't even know who her opponent is and if they're going to replace Sasha with somebody. But it was supposed to be Sasha and Ronda. Not going to be. Um, so there may be a Ronda Rousey match, and then we have this one. Which of the two would you think would belong in a cell? Well, it's certainly not. I mean, to me, Hell in a Cell is a match where there's a, it's reached a fever pitch. Seth and Cody, a la. Um, you can even say, you know, as as not in, interested in it as I am, I, I don't hate it, but I'm not like super invested in it. You could say Omos and Bobby Lashley has reached a fever pitch, quote unquote. Like, I don't think that any women's match that they're going to be setting up on Friday or possibly Monday is going to reach a fever pitch. Maybe if Bailey comes back and challenges Ronda this Friday and the next Friday something crazy happens, they can put it in a cell, but I, I can't imagine what else it would be. Yeah, I don't see anything being worth the cell, man, uh, on the ladies' side. Not to put down the ladies' wrestling. You know, I think the ladies' wrestling in WWE is fantastic, and I wish there was more of it. But um, you know what I hate the most, man? What? I hate ads. I hate listening to podcasts and there being ads. Don't you? The worst. But the best way that you can avoid them is to join Patreon just for a dollar and you'll get everything ad free. So are you a patron, Brad? I know you are. Of course I'm a patron. And, and, and I'll tell you, that was a very smooth transition. Yep. And we're going to... Um, take a break here and be right back as we take our first break and then we will talk some more about the week in WWE the Beyond the Mad Podcast we'll be right back welcome back to the Beyond the Mad Podcast alright Brad we are back and the other thing I wanted to talk about with SmackDown is we had Gunther out there with 
through Gulak in a squash, and then he tried to attack Gulak post-match with the Boston Crab, and Ricochet ran in. Looks like we're going to have a few between Ricochet and Gunther. Seems like they're moving in the direction of Gunther being the Intercontinental Champion. That's one of the things that I was calling for a couple weeks ago. How do you feel about this Gunther and Ricochet situation? You know, this is the type of thing that I would love to see on this pay-per-view. Ricochet versus Gunther. We have two weeks, two Fridays to set it up. I would love to see this as a match on the pay-per-view. I can't remember the last time the Intercontinental Championship had a spot on a pay-per-view. I think it would be a great match, a great contrast of styles. You know, the big guy versus the high-flying little guy. Um, it, I think it, it is a perfect thing, and it's a perfect way to elevate Gunther if he wins it into the spotlight of like, wow, we now have a legitimate person in our hands. This is not just an NXT call up. This is a big man who's here to stay. Yeah, I agree. It would be great for Gunther. I think that he's worthy of the championship. I think having big guys like him with a guy like Ricochet who can create the bigger, the guy, the more movement you can create around them, the better match you can get with a guy like Omos. They're trying to have Lashley play the speed game, bring movement around and make it interesting. It's working out. Okay. But honestly, it's not that great. And part of that's Omos, you know, a guy like Veer, big monster, they got him working with Mysterio, another cruiser that can move around and do a lot. And I think that this matchup, Ricochet and Gunther, is perfect. They could produce an outstanding match. You know, I've seen Gunther have an outstanding match with Mansoor. Just imagine what he can do with somebody like Ricochet. So I'm here for that feud. Sad to see Ricochet lose that intercontinental title. You know, he came out to make that save the other night. He didn't even have the title with him. Does he even carry the belt around? What's he doing? Weird. Weird. I agree. I noticed that too. You know, Gunther, not to get too off topic here, but Gunther and Raquel uh, Rodriguez really just seem very parallel to me on the men's and women's side. Obviously, one's a heel, one's not, but, it, you know, the power, the strength, the recent call up, the whole thing, I, I just see a very big parallel with the two of them because, ironically, they couldn't be more different <laughs> as people. But it, it's it's really interesting to see those two taking such a prominent stance or such a prominent placement on SmackDown, you know, partially because of in injuries, but nevertheless. Yeah, I, I'm a fan of Raquel's too. I thought that she looked good in her match the other night. You know, it was only three minutes long, but that's, you know, they put her in a spot at the top of the hour right after the RK Bro backstage promo. So it was a spot where people are going to be tuned in to see it, you know, theoretically. And I thought that she did well in that match, did well the week before with Rousey. Do you think that we're going to move in, you know, sort of fast track to Raquel versus Rousey if we don't see a return of Bailey because we need an opponent for Rousey? Where do you see them going with Raquel in the immediate future? Oh, going with Raquel, who knows? Who, it could go in so many directions. It could be a Natalia, something as weak as like sort of like a Natalia feud. And it could be something as good as like a three-way for the SmackDown Championship. I, I don't know. I, I don't see her facing Ronda again right now just because, you know, they're both, you know, they, they want them both to be liked. Uh, babyface, babyface doesn't really work as well on a pay-per-view, in my opinion. What I would do if I was WWE, just getting back to your, your prior point prior to the commercial, I would start this, and I don't think they will, but I would start this women's tag team tournament. I would start it with eight teams. I would get four of the matches out of the way. Uh, sorry, five of the matches out of the way. And that sixth match for the tag team championship, I would have it hell in a cell. You'd have to throw it together really quick. But that would be a big, if Vince wants to do it, a big FU to Sasha and Naomi to say, hey, we're not featuring the tag team championships. It's our women's hell in a cell match for the tag team championship. It would be a great, I mean, you know, you'd have to include some NXT teams for sure. But if you did it properly, you could have two matches on SmackDown, two matches on Raw, you know, another semifinals match on um, another two final semifinal matches on SmackDown the Friday before the pay-per-view and Sunday have the stipulation that the two finalist teams are in hell in a cell for the women's tag team championship. I would love that. Um, but with Raquel, I have no idea where they're going with it, man. No idea. 
Yeah, I don't know what they're going to do with the women's tag championship tournament thing. They haven't even, you know, let us know about any of the teams. Uh, it's definitely going to involve NXT teams. What I've heard is it'll involve NXT teams, but they won't be permanently brought up to the main roster. They will just be there for part of the tournament. That'll happen on TV. I don't think they can get it all together before Hell in the Cell. If they do, that'd be impressive. But I think, honestly, that Nikki, A.S.H., and Dewdrop are going to be the next women's tag champions because they were involved in that six-pack challenge match that got uh, canceled or walked out on whatever, however you want to view it. And, you know, they're really the only other team that exists right now except for whatever teams are going to throw together and the NXT teams. But moving on from that, the only other thing I wanted to talk about from SmackDown is Butch and he feuding with the New Day continually. We're going to continue to see the New Day next week in a six-man match with a mystery partner. Pretty sure it's telegraphed that this mystery partner is going to be Drew McIntyre. Do you have any interest in this feud at all still, or do you think it's cold? You know what? I really, I, I'm telling you, mark it down. This is going to exceed expectations on Friday. I really think it's going to be more interesting than we think. I think adding this mystery person, the presentation of the mystery person will probably come across very well. And it will kind of you know equalize the situation in terms of three versus two. Now it's three versus three. And I just have a weird feeling it's going to come across well. That might end up leading to another Hell in a Cell match between these groups, which I don't know if we really need. But I do think this is going to come across well. All right. Well, it'd be nice to see it. Surprise. You know, New Day's had great matches before. They have a guy like McIntyre in there. It can be good. I think people are, you know, very stereotypically um, critical of Butch and his character and things like that. I think Butch does great work in the ring and he's doing great work with what they're giving him. And, you know, I'm not really against Butch or Seamus or Holland. And I think last week, um, not Kofi, but Xavier actually presented himself like in a way that was somewhat likable as opposed to the trombone playing nonsense, goofy stuff we normally see. And we see more of that out of the New Day. I'm fine with seeing them doing stuff. The last thing on SmackDown that I wanted to just address very quickly was the Happy Corbin segment. It felt like he was saying things that were almost directed at Sasha Banks from Vince McMahon saying, you know, you had to listen to your boss, something like that. And I paid for the steak that you eat. He was obviously directing this at Madcap Moss in the promo but the words sounded like they were more directed at Sasha Banks. Did you think that that was the case there, or do you think it's just a coincidence? No, I noticed it immediately. I did see people writing and like posting comments about it after the show or days after, but I noticed it immediately. The, the word boss, I was your boss, um, was clearly thrown in there for a reason. I think this promo was awesome, honestly. I. I, I cannot tell you how good I thought this promo was. And like, oh, I hate Happy Corbin. He's such a loser. He's so annoying. You know what? He did a bang up job in this in this promo. In my opinion, it was totally directed at Sasha. And it, it, you know, I, I made you. Um, you know, all these things. Almost like it was Vince saying, "I gave you this opportunity. Don't fuck me over, and, and you're going to end up screwed." You know that sort of thing. All right. Well. So that's that for SmackDown on Raw. We opened up with Riddle and he had his promo there. I felt like the crowd didn't really give, you know, normally when you open the show, like you said, you got who, no, no matter who comes out, it's the first person and the crowd's going to erupt. We didn't really see the crowd erupt for Riddle coming out. They did get into it, you know, further down the line in his promo when he started talking about, Right when he got the RK bro chance going and things like that. But, you know, I guess we already assessed that we thought Riddle did pretty good in the promo. So we'll move on to the match. What do you think of the match with the Street Profits and Riddle and the Usos having Zayn there? How do you feel about 
you know, just where they're going with Riddle and Riddle as a singles competitor moving forward. Or do you think he's believable? And do you think he's presented that way? Do you think he has you know, work to go to get to there? Very believable. Very good. Um, he, he definitely can carry himself. I mean, the match itself, I mean, it, it, it was a good match. It was just so meaningless that, like, you know, to me, I was like, well, what's on the line here? Especially after the last match that we saw in WWE was the most important match. Going to this, it kind of felt like a little bit of, okay, nothing's on the line. It's the Street Profits. It's Riddle. Okay, whatever. You know, Sami Zayn, fine. There's no title on the line. So, to me, it, it just didn't feel important. But it, it, it was really good to see Riddle as like the star of those six people. And even though the Usos are the hugest stars as a team, Riddle really clearly outshined both of them and everyone in the ring. And it was clear who the spotlight was on. Yeah, I definitely think that Riddle, in the way he conducted himself in the promo, was much more serious, like I said earlier. And then in the match, when he had got his hot tag, he did the a lot of the Randy Orton moves and then did the, you know, he did his stuff too. And he did his exploder suplexes out of the corner. He got one of the Usos with it, got rid of all the Usos. Ford hit that suicide dive and, and the Usos showed ass when they saw Riddle was that, you know, jacked up and that fired up to tear everybody apart. He went right after the Usos in the match as soon as he was tagged in. I thought that was a good spot for him. So it showed that he had that hatred for the bloodline. And then also having Sami Zayn left in the ring showed how much the bloodline really cares about him. So I thought that that was a nice touch too. But overall, also having the Street Profits in there sort of let the fans know that, you know, even though they did all these things to try to get over on RK Bro during the time when they were leading into the unification, they're still baby faces, they're still good guys, they're still have riddles back and all that stuff like that. Um, but that's pretty much what I got out of that one. We also had Bobby Lashley come out and cut a promo. I thought that he actually did pretty well with this promo. He did make a couple mistakes and he's no MVP behind the mic. But how do you think Lashley did as a baby face for his promo? I thought he was good. I didn't like how the crowd was wanting him for a little bit, which I didn't even understand why they would be doing that to him in that spot so early in the show. But okay. I, by the way, I, I thought this was the worst crowd that I've seen on a Raw in a very long time. Um, very long time. They would stand up, but they wouldn't cheer. Um, they were very quiet, in my opinion. I don't know. It just didn't seem like a like a really that excited of a crowd. Um, especially for a city where WWE doesn't come too often. But um, regardless of that, um, I, yeah, I thought Bobby did a good job. I thought he was, you know, very likable and, and very sort of, uh, you know, engaged in what was going on with Omos. He seemed pretty passionate about it. I thought he was good. So how do you feel about Bobby and MVP? How do you feel about MVP in the ring? It looks like that the stipulation for Hell in a Cell is going to be a handicap match. So it's going to be MVP and Omos take it on Bobby Lashley. How do you feel about that? You know, the match ended up being ended in a DQ. So it was a little bit stupid the way that it ended, but whatever. We're going to have a handicap match at Hell in a Cell. How do you feel about that? And well, we all hear that you know MVP. Oh, we don't need. I don't need to see MVP wrestle. Heard a lot of people saying that. To me, this was something fun. It was something new. It was almost like getting like a new wrestler on the roster who also was not a rookie type of thing. It was. It was. Cool. I thought it was cool. His Weasley ways, how he kept running away and run away. I thought it was pretty good. Actually, it was one of my favorite things in the night. Truthfully, to see him wrestle, I, I have to be honest with you. Yeah, you know, it's good to see him get back in the ring if he can. Um, you know, he's not probably... I just think he's so good at a manager that he doesn't need to be a wrestler to do this. But, you know, I'm not that interested in the Omos and Ash and Bobby Lashley stuff. But uh, And I just think that Bobby Lashley, with his promos, he does a good job when he gets energetic and he gets real intense. But when he's trying to remember scripted lines, 
he flubs up and messes up all the time. And I think he's one of those people where if you focus on where his mistakes are, you're going to think his promo is bad. But if you just focus on what he's trying to say, it sounds fine. MVP, you know, he's kind of right in what he says that I'm, you know, I made, you, know, you never did anything till I was with you and stuff like that. You know, Bobby Lashley didn't really achieve a lot of the things he did until MVP was with him, but that's beside the point. Having them in this match offers another way to protect Omos in this feud. But geez, it, I mean, I don't know who is going to benefit from winning or losing this. You know, if Bobby wins, okay, he won a handicap match, but then that buries Omos. And if Omos wins, it doesn't do anything good for Bobby, who's supposed to be one of their big baby faces they're pushing. So I just feel like that this feud's hurting Bobby Lashley in the long term. How about you? Yeah, um, I totally agree with that. And one of the, you know, the weird thing is that like normally a steel cage like ends a feud and they had the steel cage match on Raw. And then next week it was like, all right, we have a new challenge for Omos and Bobby Lashley. It, it, it just, to me, it seems like it should have ended with the steel cage, not continued on. And I don't know where this goes from here or why it would need to go further, but I guess there's nothing else for Bobby to do right now. I mean, you know, maybe when Kevin Owens finishes up with Ezekiel and, 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 uh, you know, and, and this finishes up with Omas, maybe like those two get together, Kevin Owens and Bobby Lashley. I mean, I, I don't really know where it goes from here beyond this with Omas. Um, so to me, it's, kind of dead in the water right now and it's not too engaging but you know um i th i think that's kind of where we're at with it yeah i agree with you now we'll move on from that because you know there's not much more to say about lashley and omos uh judgment day had another promo tonight right now currently three members edge inviting more members on i felt like this you know last week i was starting to come around on judgment day i liked what they were doing i felt like edge did a good job behind the mic then this week we got priest out here telling everybody to rise everybody listened and did rise and then he continued to tell them to rise, rise, rise. And, you know, he's not terrible behind the mic. Then we get Rhea Ripley on the mic looking like she's reading off a teleprompter. And then Edge gets on the mic. And while some of his words are great, saying the parts about people being in their cubicles eating Cheetos and comparing himself to Michael Jordan and Wayne Gretzky to me makes him sound like an uncool dad who isn't up to par or up to speed with the contemporary, you know, superstars that you would compare yourself to. You know how many people I know when I mention Michael Jordan, they don't even know who the hell I'm talking about. And I just think that he should have said, what if LeBron James and Tom Brady and, you know, these guys that are actually performing in this day and age that are the greatest. Now, I understand the um, comparison he was trying to make, that they worked so hard to make it to the top. But I just don't, I can't get into this Judgment Day stuff when they're taking so much time off the show to just deliver these heavy-handed promos. I understand the method behind it, you know, WWE likes you to understand what the meaning behind things are. So they're going to sort of whack you over the head with it until you get it. But I just feel like this is too much stuff going on with them. Way too much interference type of crap going on. And I just feel like it's very heavy handed and it's not really in the best interest of edge to continue to be doing this, but he's obviously going to do whatever he wants. I like the idea of having a faction led by a veteran that provides guidance to younger wrestlers and helps them resurrect their career. It is rumored that the next member is going to be T-Bar, Dominic Dijakovic, and I think that's going to be it for their members for now. I don't think Champ is going to end up being joining it, even, even though we've gotten that um, tease and that rumor over and over again, uh, that may still happen, but I think it's going to be T-Bar as the next member. What do you think about Judgment Day overall? What do you think about this segment? 
And where are you on Judgment Day? Yeah, um, you know, when Edge talks about the Cheetos and the Wayne Gretzky and all that stuff and the crowd, and you know, to me, the whole thing that makes the Judgment Day thing appealing is this incredible sort of evil sense that you're supposed to get from them. And when he's talking about things like that, it doesn't make him seem evil. It just makes him seem like kind of an asshole. You know, not really like the epitome of evil, which is what the entrance with the wings and the purple and black lights and everything kind of suggests. But when you're talking about things like that, it doesn't make you come across that way. So, you know, I I like it. I mean, I think the most interesting thing is what you just alluded to, like who's going to join next and, you know, what are they going to do? The, the part I, I really liked about this, actually, it's going to sound kind of weird, but it's like with Morgan joining up with AJ Styles to kind of combat this evil, I think that's been actually a really interesting part of this like just sort of just seeing you know the, this really cool female superstar and this aj styles who's one of the best kind of teaming up in this weird way to kind of combat this i think that's like a, been the best part of it is the, the best part of it yeah baby face reaction with balor aj and liv's been the best part for me and i was waiting at the end of that match when aj was getting destroyed and Liv was down and they were you know kind of both sort of trying to help each other but also getting beaten at the same time i thought finn balor was going to come in run into the ring as if he was going to help them and just start beating on aj and join them you know quote unquote because everyone that's joined this judgment day does have like a darker type of character even though they're maybe a baby face so finn bauer to me i i know you're you're saying it's probably not going to be him but he fits in perfectly you know with the black jacket and the dark music and the you know it's a fun intro song finn bauer has but it's still a dark theme song to me and i think he fits in perfect so that's what i thought was going to happen you know at the end of that segment but you're waiting on a third person to come in and save them. Doesn't happen. I don't know, man. Rhea Ripley sounded terrible. I actually thought Priest sounded pretty good. I thought Priest was like, wow, like he sounds pretty authoritative and he's got this very booming voice. And it sounded good to me with Priest. I think this is a great thing for Damian Priest. I think Priest sounded good. I thought that he didn't need to tell everybody to rise seven times when they stood up the first time. But, right, um, they stood up. Yeah, they already they all stood up. Yeah, and, and there was no reason to say it. But I guess in the writing of it, they anticipated no one standing up, so he was going to be a jerk. Well, yeah, that's the thing, though. At the end of the day, if you're good at cutting a promo, you improvise when the crowd actually listens to you, and then you sure. say something else. But yeah, I, you know, for me, you know, the cheap heat stuff that Edge does, you know, there's supposed to be a mystique about this group. You know, they're supposed to be, a, we're better than everybody else. We don't need to talk that way, you know, and it just, some of the stuff just doesn't add up when he's doing that. And I just feel like they belabor a lot of the points they're trying to make. And there are a lot of people who think that Finn Balor's going to be somebody who turns on the baby faces and joins this group. I think that the group would be really powerful if they had somebody like Balor in there. I think it's more going to be, you know, your lower end guys like T-Bar or something like that. But I do agree that the baby face, you know, the too sweet stuff that's going on with Liv Morgan and AJ Styles and Balor, I think is nice. And I like that. You know, I'd like to see more stuff. I'm not a fan of the mixed tag matches in WWE. The one on this show I thought was horrendous. The, you know, there were some nice spots with Liv Morgan, you know, doing the assisted Hurricane Rana and the co-breaker at the end. And then Edge ended up interfering to help Ripley win. Uh, I get tired of seeing the post-match beatdowns by the heel faction that cheats to win. You know, I, I understand that's part of it, but... You know, I would have liked to see Finn Balor run in this time, but with the mixed tag matches, just the fact that you can have a baby face beating the crap out of a heel and then the woman tags in and the baby and the baby face can't continue to beat the crap out of the heel because the woman's tagged in and his woman partner then has to tag in and it's like it just the psychology doesn't make sense. You know? So yeah. for that match I wasn't that interested in it. You know, I I like everybody who is a part of it. And, you know, I'm not sitting here saying that Judgment Day is the worst thing ever. 
I just am disappointed in what I've seen so far. I'm obviously going to stick with it and keep it going, but you know, I'm just not a huge fan of it right now. And I think they could be doing a lot of things differently, but we'll see where it goes, man. You got anything else you know, on, on judgment? Day yeah. We take a break. Yeah. Um, I found it really interesting that edge mentioned John Cena, you know, John Cena, um, is he the hero, which he you know, plays and whatever is he the hero that comes in and eventually ends this judgment day well, that that remains to be seen but that would be a really cool matchup to see john cena coming back to defeat this sort of evil entity that would be just incredible yeah john cena and edge were one of the you know that's one of edge's best feuds of all time is his feud he had with john cena way back when and it would be fantastic to see Cena come back as the big time baby face and viewed with this heel faction and see what happened. I think it would be great to have Cena back here with Edge and I noticed that too. I was waiting for you to mention it. I thought that was great foreshadowing. We're going to take a break now. We'll be right back. The Beyond the Mat Podcast. We'll be right back. to the Beyond the Mat podcast. All righty, we're back here for the weekly fix on the Beyond the Mat podcast. We are now past Judgment Day. We are going to talk a little bit about King's Court with Veer. What do you think about Veer in the King's Court segment and the Mysterios running in? I may be in the minority. I I really like the Veer segments. I, I know a lot of people don't. I like him and I like the segments. I, I, I do think there's something to it. And this was the one time where I felt like all of these squash matches that we were seeing, they were kind of interesting, you know, and, and I did not mind this King's court. I didn't really understand why they needed to get, um, uh, Jerry Waller involved that, that I did not understand at all. Like what was the point of that? It could have been, you know, Kevin Owens could have had a KO show introducing the year. It didn't need to, they didn't need to bring him in, but he's just native to that area. He's done a lot of stuff when they do stuff in that area. And he also, it's just a vehicle to have, you know, like you said, KO show would be a way to get beer to talk, just a way to get beer to talk. And uh, Jerry can be a good antagonist, you know, with his stupid jokes. So that's basically what they, they just gave him something to do there. I th- I thought with the segment, you know, the stuff with Veers from in fine, he's just not ever going to be more than a mid card, you know, stereotypical heel, which is fine. And I like the way that they have done the in ring um, interviews with the jobbers before he basically destroys them. And I don't know what I don't understand why he would be afraid of Dominic and his son, but. That's that's the only thing that I don't understand is why this guy like Veer, who's a complete animal, you know, before his squash matches, he just dutifully stands there in the ring and waits for the bell to ring when normally, you know, he's ripping people apart and doesn't care that the bell rings to end the match. And then we have the Mysterios that are supposed to be a threat to him when four drop kicks can't even drop them from the two of them. So... You know, like I said, having movement around a, a, a guy like Veer who's big and doesn't sell much is a good thing. But at the end of the day, you know, the Mysterios and Veer, do you think that's a, does that have any of your emotions uh, involved or is it something that you just aren't behind? How do you feel about it? No, it doesn't have any of my emotions involved as a feud, but I do think like seeing them in the ring against each other does have some sort of, you know, interest to me. Um, what, what I would do if I was the writers with Veer, honestly, I would just humanize him, but still make him a total dick and a monster. But I, I think this sort of savage act is not the thing that's going to get him over. I mean, if Veer, you know, the reason I say that is because Veer was saying in his promo, he's like, you know, you got to respect, uh, you know, Ray Mysterio, but his son Dominic is holding him back, or he's he's the he's the one I have a problem with, whatever. Like to me, if you're that much of an animal, you don't have respect for anyone. Like you, almost like 
he wouldn't even know to have respect for Rey Mysterio if he's his character. So to me, like I, I would make Veer like almost like just a human who's an animal, like you know, someone that you could kind of relate to, but he's just really angry and flies off the rail type of thing. And I know that he's articulate enough in real life and well spoken enough to do something like that. I just wish that's the way they portrayed him and not as a savage. Yeah, they portray him as a, you know, 80s or, you know, sort of indie promotional, local promotion heel, their big heel that they have, you know, that after the show, you'd see him at the local diner at the, you know, bar drinking coffee or whatever, talking to people normally. He just doesn't come off as a guy who's this savage uh, killer. And with that, with the character that they have him in, do you see him going any further than just being, like, where are they going to go after the Mysterios? Do you see anything after that? No, but they're, they're going to have to do something with the character. Like, they again, they, they could have him as a guy who totally loses his cool. Almost the role that Damian Priest had before Judgment Day, where he was this, you know, this guy who just lost his mind. And then, you know, and then he just can't stop. You know, he gets disqualified and he, he, he fights you after the bell and he's just nuts. But, like, I think that's the perfect role. Almost like it, it should have been put on him and not Damian Priest um initially but yeah man I, I just don't love the the character and the way it's being portrayed but i really like veer i, I think veer is actually terrific yeah or can be terrific. i think one of the reasons he's portrayed well what it is is he's not you know the best at selling he's not the best in the ring a little bit green there but he's very powerful he has some good things about him has a good look so if they dress him up this way and cosplay him as this type of character that's what they feel is working for him i don't think it has any longevity to it it can work in this feud with the mysterios but i agree with you they need to change it you know i, I thought this segment with uh the jerry the king lawler was you know, they, they could have did something different with this. It was kind of a waste of time. We had Alexa Bliss next against Nikki A.S.H. Nikki A.S.H. held up okay in the match, but ultimately Bliss won with the Twisted Bliss. Nikki A.S.H. was a little bit, um, you know, a little bit too braggadocious when she would get the upper hand, and that would give Alexa Bliss the window to take care of her. Didn't see much of Dewdrop after the match telling Nikki A.S.H. to, you know, get serious or whatever she's been telling him lately. So I don't know what's going on with that whole thing. But we did see before the match, and this is the more important part, Alexa Bliss in her promo said, you know, Nikki A.S.H. dresses up like a superhero and I just carry around a doll. But sounds kind of weird when you say it out loud, but whatever, that's what it is. Was that her just basically giving a shoot promo and kind of, you know, trashing the creative she's been given or what was that? That was a really strange line that came out of her. It was kind of funny, but what did you think of that? It's exactly right. I just thought it was her honestly just being funny. I, I, I really didn't read anything into it. Like I know everything they say usually has a purpose, but I don't think that she, I, th I think if she said, Hey guys, I want to drop the doll. I, I really don't think that they would have a huge problem with that. Honestly, I really don't. I mean, I, you know, we all thought the doll was going to be dead anyway when, when it got ripped up by sh with the Charlotte Flair thing a few months ago or many months ago. So I don't know. I, I just, you know, the thing with Alexa is she comes out there. She looks fantastic. She's someone that people are definitely drawn to no question about it. She is, she has a lot of star power to her, a lot. And, you know, it's weird to me that I get it. She's just coming back. Asuka gets pushed right to the top of the ladder, almost an identical situation of coming back. And Alexa is like, kind of like doing nothing. You know, she's fighting Nikki. She's, you know, she's taking on Sonya Deville in three second matches. I don't understand. I want them to do something more with her because I think she deserves it. She is to me, incredible when she speaks. She is such a great actress. Um, maybe I'm in the minority. I, I don't know, but she is so dynamic and, and personable and charming, and she's just beautiful. She's got it all. She's she's 
got so much to, to offer. And I would have pushed Alexa to the top, not Asuka, but, but, but hey, that's, that's me. Yeah, I agree. She's outstanding. I think a lot of fans would agree with that as well. She, I think right now they're building her up to bring her back up to the top. I think that the promo was sort of her almost acknowledging the circumstances with the doll and with Nikki A.S.H., but also making fun of the fact that people make fun of it because it's just, it is what it is. You know, it's not even worth mentioning. She has the doll. She doesn't have the doll. Who cares? Um, it's nice to see her wrestling. She's got three wins in a row. So they're definitely trying to show us that she's better and bigger than the Nikki A.S.H.'s and the Sony DeVille's of the world, and they're going to build her into being something bigger. Asuka coming right back into the title picture is kind of an annoying if you look at it in a vacuum compared to Alexa Bliss, but when you consider the fact that she's the one who Becky gave the Raw Women's title to when she left, and you know that's the whole story there, that she and Becky have unfinished business and then Becky and Belair have unfinished business. That's why they have the three of them working together right now. It seems like they're going to move on to Rhea Ripley and Belair after this because they've been working the dark matches and house shows. And then maybe Alexa Bliss, you know, gets a shot over the summertime or wins money in the bank or something like that. But she's definitely somebody I think that needs to be featured prominently because she is definitely... All the things you described, a star, a great actress, she's beautiful, and she has good in-ring abilities. And not to mention, another thing that they could do with her is they could involve her in this women's tag team tournament, and she could form a tag team with Liv Morgan or whoever they feel like putting her with, and she could be featured that way as well. I don't know. Um, but, you know, moving on from Alexa Bliss, you have anything else on Alexa Bliss? I mean, one thing that you could say about Alexa is that she just got pinned, I believe, by Bianca two months ago or three months ago in the elimination chamber. So, you know, she was kind of involved in that just as much as Asuka was. I mean, Asuka, I get it, you know, a year and a half ago or whatever it was with whoever. I just feel like they could have put her in that situation rather than Asuka. But again, it didn't happen and it's not what's happening. So we'll move on. All right, so next up we have The Miz and Cody Rhodes. I feel like The Miz is a guy who is an excellent heel, excellent heel character. He knows exactly what to say in his promos before the match to get the crowd to boo him, to hate him, and to cheer for whoever he's fighting against. That being said, we've already seen him against Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes has already beaten him before, and I feel like Cody Rhodes' style along with Miz's very safe style, Cody being more of like the indie wrestler combined with the WWE style wrestling. He just moves too much and has too much going on there for a guy like Miz who wrestles so safely to handle. We saw about three or four botches in this match alone, and then it ended in a DQ. I didn't think the match was terrible, but it was a little bit rough. How do you feel about how Miz and Cody looked and how do you feel about Cody moving forward considering that right now they're having a Cody countdown clock every single time on Raw until his segment, which honestly is a good thing to let people know when he's coming on if they're interested, but it can also backfire and be a lot of pressure on him as the baby face that they're pushing and they can get pushed back from fans. So do you think he's being pushed too hard as a baby face? And how do you think they're handling Cody? Where do you think we're going from here? I don't think he's being pushed too hard. I just think like, you know, there are certain aspects that are a bit much, the countdown clock, you know, he's coming on at the 10 o'clock hour, you know, it, it, you know, the other thing that I'll say about the, the, the crowd reaction, if you watch Cody enter the ring for this match, this is another reason why I thought that crowd was the worst. He, he goes to the, hard camera side of the um, arena where I'm sorry, the, the side that you see on television and he urges the crowd, get up, get up, you know, like kind of let's get excited. I'm here. You know, they barely move. I mean, I urge you to watch that back. It is so weird. That crowd was absolutely bizarre. And I don't think that that's like a reflection of the WWE universe having fatigue of Cody, but 
I do think they're pressing it a little bit much. And, you know, to me, the, the Seth Cody thing, as great as both of them are, and they're both terrific, it, it feels a little Bobby Lashley homage to me at this point. Like, I almost feel like it should be over and it's not. And, and you know, I'm not... I'm not really loving that feud that much. And I wish I was loving it more. I just, it, 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 to me, it's not doing a lot for me. Well, the story is Sessa made, man. You know, he doesn't need to have everything that Cody is trying to achieve because he's already achieved it. And so it's more a story of Cody trying to get past this guy who is, you know, I've said a million times the term gatekeeper, but, you know, the top guy in WWE who is one of the greatest wrestlers, you know, who when Cody left, he was one of the greatest wrestlers. He continued to climb and achieve all the things he wanted to achieve. Cody wants those things. It drives Seth nuts to lose, but he, as his character, won't deal with just losing once. He always wants that rematch, so that's sort of why... We have them going three times. I'm not predicting that we're going to see a fourth time. I think this is the last time. And it progressing to the cell makes sense. You know, it's, I can understand being fatigued by the feud, but they'll move on from it. It's just a stepping stone for Cody Rhodes. And there's not really any other big heels that work the way Seth does for him to rub off of other than Owens. But he's wrapped up with Ezekiel right now, which we're going to get into next. Ezekiel and Chad Gable had a match. I thought that the match was basically a repeat of whatever we saw between these two before, but it ended in a disqualification as, actually, no, it didn't end in a disqualification. It ended in a roll-up after two guys got thrown out. Otis got thrown out and Owens got thrown out and they hadn't even made it up the aisle before the bell rang for the roll-up distraction finish how do you feel about ezekiel's in-ring work so far and more importantly how do you feel about kevin owens and ezekiel facing each other at hell in a cell and also owens during this whole feud he it seems like he's been carrying it and making it interesting what do you think about him he was hilarious the other night in my opinion yeah, he's he's the best. I mean, he's he's tremendous in every way. I mean, the problem with it is like you know Ezekiel's this guy we're supposed to love, but like there, there's never been a reason to love him. You know, there's there's never been any sort of like oh like he uh, you know he saved this person when they were about to get beaten up by Kevin Owens or he you know did something heroic to stop a, a, a heel or there's been nothing like he's done nothing it's just hey we don't like your name we think you're a liar and uh, you know this is where it all stems from so to me it's just like kind of weak creative like even if Kevin Owens was beating down someone in the ring and this guy comes in who the hell is this guy. Who the hell do you think you are? To me, that's more effective. So you know, I, I'd love to say I'm invested in it. I, I just, I'm not. I, you know, I, I don't, I, I love seeing Kevin Owens. I, I, I think he's the, one of the funniest people. He, he's so funny. He could be a comedian. He's that funny, but he's also a great wrestler, but I, I just don't you know, care that much about the Ezekiel thing. Uh, you know, I care, I care very little about it, to be honest. Yeah, I think the whole thing, the star here has been Kevin Owens. He was really funny on the commentary, yelling at Byron Saxton and telling Gable to beat the truth out of him. I don't know where they're going to go with this. I don't even know what the purpose of the match is. You know, there's no, is there a stipulation? If he, if he wins the match, he's got to take some kind of test that proves that he is who he is. I don't even understand why Kevin Owens wants to fight him so bad, except for the fact that we know Kevin Owens hates liars, but you know, as far as the actual feud goes, I don't really care. I just feel like the material's been pretty entertaining, but I have no idea what to expect in the match. I know it'll be good because Kevin Owens does great work in the ring. His, his move set's really smooth and fun to watch, but Ezekiel just feels like the generic wrestler that can do a little bit in the ring, but who the hell knows whether it's going to be that entertaining of a match. I'm not really that excited for it, but I am excited to see where they end up going with this because they got to figure out something at some point. They have to, 
either drop the accusing him of being Elias or they need to have Elias and him appear at the same time or do something. I have no idea what they're going to do. I don't even want to predict it right now. But as far as this feud goes, I can't say that I'm that interested in it other than the humorous aspects of it. You have anything else on this one? Nope. All right, so we're going to take one last break, then we'll move on to the main event and our awards for the week. The Beyond the Mat Podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Beyond the Mat Podcast. All right, so like I said earlier, we had a main event for Raw this week of Asuka and Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch ends up winning the match after Asuka went for a roundhouse kick and ended up wiping out Bianca Belair. And then it seemed like Becky was supposed to throw Asuka into the announce table, but they may have been running out of some time. And she sort of just nudged her, then ran back into the ring. Referee was making the count. Asuka got back into the ring. I think that what they were going for was that it took Asuka all she had to get back in the ring to make the count. And then we got a quick roll up by Becky Lynch. It it seemed very clunky, the finish. Didn't seem very clean or really logical why Asuka would be able to be rolled up just after getting into the ring. But I think the reasons I just stated are the reasons why it happened. And sometimes when you're on live TV and have time constraints, things happen. How'd you feel about the match? What do you think about it being a triple threat? And who do you think is going to win at Hell in a Cell? This is so much better having Becky Lynch in it. I mean, you know, I have problems with Becky's new character. I, I don't like the way she dresses. I don't like the way she looks. I don't, I, I, I think she's, you know, I know she's purposely supposed to look ugly, but I think, you know, she doesn't have to. Um, regardless, like, you know, I noticed some interesting things and, and exactly what you just mentioned. The, the, the final pin on Asuka was really weird. Like her, Becky's legs were not even on her shoulders. It was just like she was so paralyzed after Bianca Belair got kicked in the face. And she was just so shocked and just couldn't even move her shoulder up. It just made no sense, like you mentioned. Um, but it could have been a byproduct of something else and something else might have been supposed to happen. Who knows? But... I I think this is so much better that Becky's in it. If it was Asta Bianca, honestly, I, I would care less about that than almost <laughs> than just about anything. Ezekiel, Kevin Owens, whatever it is. It, 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 to me, that matchup has no juice, as they say. Um, now, adding Becky in, it does have the juice. But I think we all know Bianca is not losing this matchup unless some miracle happens. Yeah, I agree. I think Bianca's going to go over here. I think that Asuka's going to eat the pin, and it's going to be a situation where Becky, you know, has the match won in some way, shape, or form. She gets KOD'd, and then Asuka wins, or Asuka gets pinned by Belair. But regardless, we can move on from that one. We have a couple of fan questions here to get into from fan who wrote in several questions here about Sasha Banks. The first one about Sasha Banks and Naomi, mainly about Sasha though, regarding WWE versus AEW's creativity or lack thereof in promos and the scripted nature of WWE promos versus the -the off-the-cuff nature of AEW promos. A lot of people are arguing that Sasha Banks would have more freedom in AEW. This person questions whether or not, in fact, the question states, AEW gives their performers more freedom in their promos to say what they want, but would Sasha Banks even get the screen time to express her creativity should she be in AEW, given the fact that they don't really feature women very much on television? What do you feel about that answer? Thank you for writing in. First of all, you welcome to write in anytime. We'd love to hear from, from people that listen to this podcast and, and thank you. Um, to me, you know, listen, I love Sasha Banks. So please understand that this answer for me is coming from that place. I think 
She is the best. She's one of my favorite people to see come out. She's one of my favorite people in WWE, male or female. So I'm just telling you that right now. To me, Sasha doesn't really have a lot of creativity on the mic. I mean, I, I think that's like in a certain way, like, yeah, she's cool with her. I'm the boss and I'm the best and I'm the, you know, whatever. All that stuff is very cool and I love it. But she sounds like she's reading. Like we, we just criticized Rhea Ripley before for, you know, oh, she sounds like a teleprompter. To me, Sasha comes across that way a lot too. And I, I really hate to say that, but I don't think she's the best promo. I think people like Alexa Bliss are, are a way better promo than Sasha, to be honest with you. I think Becky's a way better promo than Sasha. Sasha, I think Charlotte's a better promo than Sasha because I think Sasha, you know, has this very scripted and she knows what she's supposed to say and she delivers it in a tone that to me sounds like she's reading something or memorized something. Not to take anything away from her, she's fantastic, but I don't think her going to AEW all of a sudden she's going to be like, uh, you know, something really uh, different. And 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 I think she needs her lines written for her, and and whether she likes them or not, she needs them written out, and she needs to have a plan what she's going to say. Um, so no, I don't think it makes a difference. I don't think she would be able to be more creative. I think actually a lot of the most creative stuff about her character would be gone. The Sasha Banks, one of the most incredible gimmicks you'll ever see in women's wrestling. That's all gone if she goes to AEW. I think it limits her creativity tremendously, personally. And you don't think that the creativity that she'd be allowed, the freedom would allow her to get herself over with ever with whatever new gimmick she gets? I think she gets over. I, I do. I think that everyone will be really happy to see Mercedes and, you know, in, in, in AEW and the fans would, would be thrilled. But these are also, you know, fans that, no offense, were really, really excited about Tony Storm. And and Tony Storm, you know, these are people that were net knocking Tony Storm. Oh, what a loser. She gets a cream pie thrown in her face. Uh, WWE's pathetic. Tony Storm is a nobody. And then she goes to AEW and everyone's thrilled over. So people will be very excited about her. But I just don't don't know if you can take a character that good and follow up on it in another role it, it, it's like robert de niro when he was in goodfellas i'm sorry when he was in goodfellas in all these mob movies and then he goes to play um in that meet the parents movie and he's like the you know the kind of the father it, it doesn't always work where the next character is going to be better than the original one that everyone loves and knows yeah all right, well, the next thing he's asking is about the uh, plants I was talking about in the crowd. Um, he wants to know the mechanics about how the plants were working to influence the audience. And so what they were basically doing was there would be a group of them. They would get a radio signal. They would, you know, for the New Day, for example, they would get told New Day's coming out. We want to try to get a New Day Rocks chant when this spot happens in the match. And then the group of plants would then separate and try to start chants in different pockets of people and then hope that the different pockets of people would catch on and that would become a bigger pocket of people. But there would always be some sort of communication before it would happen based on the ones that I was nearby and sort of paying attention to. Now, he also says... Um, you know, this fan engagement stuff, you know, is sort of not unheard of. You think about a basketball game, a, a hockey game, they have defense and offense and, you know, all these different things. You know, do you think that the crowd sweetening and crowd plants are any different than they do in basketball or baseball or whatever, where they have the commands on the videotrons and things like that. I mean, a little bit different, but to me, you know, you, you have, for instance, at, a, at a, any athletic game, you have cheerleaders, you have people, you know, that are from and with the team that start chants. I don't think it's really that much different. You know, you have, you know, I go to Mets games as an example, you have, let's go Mets comes on the huge screen. And what does the crowd start saying? Let's go Mets. Let's go. I mean, that's literally the team telling you to start cheering because they have two runners on base and no one out. I mean, obviously sometimes that stuff starts organically. I know it starts organically at WWE events because I've been at them where they have started organically. So, um, 
As a matter of fact, I started one at the SmackDown in Long Island about three, four weeks ago, whatever it was. So I know that they do start organically. But um, in the same respect, I don't think it's that much different. I, I think every sort of team, you know, they have cheerleaders, there's mascots, there's things on the Videotron that tell you what to say. This is just WWE's way of doing it. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of the stuff, um, it, it's fine. It's the way they want to produce their TV show. And I think it is similar to the way they do it in sports, how they want to, you know, have the crowd uh, react the way that they want them. They want the home fans to chant defense or whatever, get up for third down at a football game. And it's, you know, it makes sense that they would want to do this on WWE, especially it being loud live television. So, you know, you do obviously organically want your heels and baby faces to generate the heat that they're supposed to. But at the same time, you have to have ways to help that along. And there's always been different ways of doing it, you know, for the last 30, 40, 50 years. It just depends on the technology. I think the way that they do it, but. And it's, it's a great question from your listener. And, you know, to me, uh, an even better comparison because of what you just said, Matt, this is a live television show. Let's not forget. It's when um, Oprah, you know, uh, maybe Oprah, you know, been off the air for many years, but, you know, the Maury show or any of these shows, The View, it doesn't matter which one you're talking about. When those shows, when they come back to air, notice the audience is always standing and applauding. Here's our next guest. And the, there's a there's a person who's saying, get up, cheer, get up on your feet. I remember going through a live taping of the Maury show back when I was in, um, I think it was in junior high school. It was before all the, you know, You Are the Father shows. It was something else. But they, um, the, the, the people in the audience were instructing you when to stand on your feet, when to applaud, when they come back from the break, here's what you're going to do. It's no different. This is a live television show taping on national TV. And that needs to be remembered. It's not a sports event. It, it's a television show. Well, yeah, that's the thing that I always, um, you know, it, it's just like a sitcom or SNL or whatever, but at the same time, because they're doing shows in such big venues in front of live crowds, they do need to have the ability to create those reactions and emotions from people live on the spot without them being prompted for the most part. But the adding into it with the post-production noises and the plants in the crowd and the whatever, I think is all fine if it makes the overall product more appealing and I and I don't see any reason why it doesn't so I'm okay with it and I think it it works um we're gonna get into our awards for the week right now I have mine written out and I will ask you what yours are Brad just give me one moment to pull them up all right so first off we have best match I went with the tag unification match on Smackdown what did you have for best match same RK Bro Usos. All right. Best match. Sweep it on up, up to the worst match. I had Nikki Ash and Alexa Bliss. Ooh, that's a little bit of a tough one for me. Um, I, I can't, I can't give it to that one. Um, worst match to me, you know, the, you, you might find this surprising, but I thought Cody Rhodes in the Miz. I, I did not like that match. I, I did not enjoy it. I, I and look. It's kind of hard to call those two guys who are fantastic the worst, but to me, that was not a good match. Well, you know, given the standard of Cody and, you know, Miz is a veteran, you, I would expect better. They were botching stuff all over the place. Uh, best promo, I thought Riddle's emotional promo to open Raw was actually the best one, even though I didn't feel like it was in the best spot. What do you think was the best promo? Best promo, I'm actually going to give to Paul Heyman opening SmackDown. Um, on Friday night. I thought that that was really a terrific table setter and really liked it. Yeah, the bloodline did do a good job with that one. That is a good pick there. Worst promo I felt was Judgment Day. What did you have for that one? Um, I also b believe it was Judgment Day, but, but, but the Rhea Ripley portion of the Judgment Day promo to me was the worst. All right. 
we sweep Judgment Day. Worst segment or moment for me was King's Court. I just don't think that we need Jerry the King Lawler out there with Veer grunting at him. It's like you say, like the Veer whole gimmick isn't terrible, but what they're doing with it is kind of silly. I don't mind the squash matches, but why have Jerry the King Lawler out there cracking dad jokes and him not getting torn apart by Veer because that's what Veer should do in his character. But anyway, that was my worst segment. What did you feel was the worst segment? Uh, worst promo was, um, and I believe if, if I'm getting my weeks mixed up, please forgive me. I think there was something backstage with Asuka where, look, to me, she was just acting like a complete moron. And no, I every, just couldn't. every week, every week they do this crap with her saying Becky's a baby and, you know, her. Yeah. With the broken English. Couldn't understand that she's screaming, being really wild. But I mean, I, I, I actually was so embarrassed by it. I had to fast forward through it. I couldn't watch it. Okay, so for best moment, I had Cody getting beat down, Seth taking the belt from the kid, and then Cody returning the belt to the kid after coming to, and then him having the promo on top of it, you know, indicating that he's beaten down and hurt a little bit going to this match. And that's another thing about this third match is that Seth has gone so berserk that he's gone as far as attacking Cody to hurt his knee or his back or whatever. And so part of the story going to this match is going to be Cody selling an injury. And so that's, you know, a little bit what makes it different. But I felt like that belt part and then him cutting the promo backstage, that was the best, you know, moment of the week. You know, for me, even though it was a moment I didn't like to see, the, the best moment like just in terms of being intrigued was was when Jey Uso put Riddle through the ta- through the table, and that's not to say that I liked it. I was very upset by it, but it, it, as a moment goes, to me it was super memorable and just like something I'll remember, you know, five years from now. Like holy shit, remember when that happened? That was crazy. Like so, not that it was the best moment, but it was just like the most memorable moment. All right, and then for best line of the week, I had Kevin Owens saying, you are a liar, Saxton. And basically everything Kevin Owens said was gold, but for the best line I had when he was calling Byron Saxton a liar, when Saxton was attempting to call Ezekiel Elias, what did you have for best line? Let's just go with anything Kevin Owens. All right, can't go wrong there. Worst line for me of the week was Jimmy Smith saying good teamwork by the Usos after they pulled Riddle off the apron. That's not good teamwork. That's good heel work. You don't call stuff that heels do teamwork. Uh, For some reason, sometimes Jimmy Smith doesn't seem like he understands professional wrestling at all. I mean, he's gotten better since he started, but he says things like that that don't jive with being a play-by-play announcer who understands what heels and baby faces are. Uh, what would you have for worst line? Oh, worst line. Um, geez. Matt, that's a really tough one, man. I'm going to go with something Rhea Ripley said. That's fine. Everything Rhea Ripley said was seemed like it came right off a teleprompter or she was holding a script in her hand. Um, worst dressed, I had Nikki A.S.H. because of the fact that I wanted her to have a costume change. She continues to wear that superhero costume. What would you have? Oh man, I you know I, I want to say something like Happy Corbin, but but you know look man, the guy's wearing a twelve thousand dollar hat. You can't you know you, you you can't say him. You gotta go with Nikki Ash. I mean, she looks like a fool. Yeah. Um, so best dressed, I actually am going to go a little bit against what a lot of people probably think. I'm going with Dewdrop because I felt like Dewdrop came out there looking like a badass with her leather jacket and she had different ring gear than normally. It wasn't just like that plaid looking stuff. It was more of a tight leather sort of gear that you know wasn't too revealing obviously because she's a bigger lady but I felt like it was just really 
you know, cool new look for her. I like the way her looking like that. You know, they need to get Nikki A.S.H. looking like that. So I thought that that was a nice surprise to see do drop dress like that, even though we didn't see her much. You know, obviously, you know, somebody like Alexa Bliss really is more deserving of that award. But I am just giving it to do drop because I'm grading it on a curve. Who do you have for best dressed? I, I was going to say a tie between, I thought Bianca looked terrific coming out there and Alexa Bliss looked fantastic. Yeah, I, they both looked really good. Uh, best move for me was the assisted Hurricane Rana by AJ and Liv, which they delivered to Rhea Ripley. What'd you have for best move? Ooh, it's, um, to me, it, it, it's got to be, you know, again, Jey Uso flying off that table with that elbow. All right, and then worst move for me was the botched sunset flip by the Miz on Cody Rhodes. What about you? There was three or four moves in that match where, which were really messed up, and which is why I gave it worst match. So I think you know it has to be one move out of that match, which was one of the, one of the ones you just mentioned. All right, we'll go with the Cody Cutter just so we're picking two different things. All right, best acting I felt was Becky Lynch. Uh, Lin, uh, Bliss was very funny and basically a shoot style interview in my opinion is mocking the creative but Lynch I felt was really well in acting when she was you know acting as desperate as she was and you can just see the gears turning in her head just the way that her facial expressions so I really like the way Becky Lynch is doing the acting backstage how about you Becky was terrific. Um, you're right. I'm going to give it to Riddle because he was so out of his element in a, in a certain way and really delivered uh, for his his individual promo. All right. Not a bad choice. My worst acting choice was Veer. What about you? Ooh. I got to... <laughs> can I say Rhea Ripley again? Terrible. That's fine. You can say Rhea Ripley as much <laughs> as you want. Um but that does it for our award section. The one thing that I did want to touch on tonight is that we have heard that Riddle, Orton, and Drew McIntyre are the next three opponents for Roman Reigns and that Cody Rhodes will follow thereafter pretty shortly. In my opinion, Cody Rhodes will be a champion, but I don't think WWE is going to make him a champion by beating Roman Reigns. We also have a match rumored for wrestlemania with the rock and roman reigns so my question for you is does having a match with the rock and roman reigns at wrestlemania make the meaning of cody versus roman less important number one and number two do you see cody defeating roman reigns or do you see somebody else defeating roman reigns and then cody defeating them to get the championship that he's seeking and the third question is, is Roman Reigns and Cody a match that is going to be more about making Roman Reigns even stronger than making Cody the champion at the time? Okay, my prediction for this whole thing is that Randy Orton is going to win a championship off of Roman Reigns. Randy Orton is going to win a championship off Roman Reigns, one of the two. What's going to happen is Randy is going to turn heel on Riddle. They're going to have some sort of feud. And Randy is going to come out of that still as the champion with Cody Rhodes taking that belt off Randy. That That is my prediction. I hope that I'm wrong in a certain way because I don't, you know, but I can't see, like you said, I cannot see them allowing Cody Rhodes to be the person that beats this incredible homegrown star in Roman Reigns. Yeah, somebody that's homegrown like McIntyre or Orton will beat him and then he'll beat them. I do think he'll have a feud with Reigns while Reigns is champion, but I think Reigns is going to win that feud so that it further supplants Reigns as this monster super champion that nobody can beat even beating the big baby face that comes in from another company. A lot of people don't think of it that way. A lot of people are just thinking, who's going to be, who's going to be Reigns? It's got to be Cody. They're pushing Cody. Well, they're pushing Cody and then he could fall to Reigns and then beat him later. Or Seth Rollins could beat Reigns and he could face Seth Rollins at WrestleMania again next year for the WWE title and win the title then. It seems like WrestleMania is where Cody Rhodes wants his moment to happen 
And like I said, next year we're going to have The Rock and Roman most likely at WrestleMania Survivor Series is going to be when The Rock makes his return. So a lot of people are saying, well, if we know The Rock is facing Roman Reigns, then it must be for the title. And then that means that Cody's not going to beat Roman Reigns and it makes it less important. But I say it doesn't have to be for the title when he faces The Rock, number one. Number two, Roman Reigns can beat Cody and Cody still be strong and Cody can still win a championship without winning it off Roman. Do you not agree with those points? Completely. Completely agree. I just, the way things seem to be going now, I can't see Cody losing a match in WWE. It's almost like unfathomable that he would even lose one match. Um... Well, they're so, protecting him. They're, they're, he'll lose someday, but they're protecting him that way for a while now. But, crazy. Who do you think crazy will go to I, next after he's done with Rollins real quick? Oof. I mean, could it be, could it be, you know, I know I mentioned John Cena coming back to face this Judgment Day. I mean, I think really a cool thing would be if Cody, as this hero with the red, white, and blue, comes to destroy this evil, soulless Judgment Day. Um, I think that that would be a really cool scenario. Yeah, I think that's something that they should work on. Um I thought you were about to say, how about Cena and Cody? And I was like, no, that's not going to happen because Cena is never going to come back as a heel. He's 100% baby face till the end. And But yeah, Judge hey. and, and Cody would be great. Edge and Cody would be great. Um, but hey, you can have Cena and Cody teaming up. Yeah, you could. But let's move on to our trivia question and get out of here for the night. You ready for it? 100%. All right, and your question is, who was the men's winner of the 2019 Royal Rumble? Jeez. It wasn't Edge. Edge was 2020. I, I, don't, I, I don't have it, man. Take a guess. Jeez. Oh, Christ. I don't got it, man. I, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of someone that was in a big, big event in 2019. Just think um, of somebody big right now. Um, somebody big right now. Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns. Seth Rollins is the winner. You got there it go. right with some help from your friend, but that's what I'm here for. Um. So that's about going to do it for our weekly fix tonight. Thanks for joining me, Brad. Um, anything you want to say to the listeners before we get out of here? No, let's get excited about hell in a cell and then money in the bank. All right. Thanks a lot, Brad, for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Everybody, thank you for joining in and listening to the weekly fix with me and Brad. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it is that's what I'm here for. Remember to like and subscribe on all podcast platforms that we are available on. We are on Patreon. One dollar is our lowest tier to access ad-free content and other exclusive content. And you can always follow us on Twitter at BeyondMattWWE and email a question in whenever you'd like to, matt at beyondthemat.com. Until then, I'm going to be hitting the road. But before I do that, I think I'm going to go to the nearest nudie bar and, and have a drink. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Mat. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a show. show, show, show.